Good morning to all of you. A warm welcome to a Zoom webinar uh, from um, organized by GMOA and Society for Health Research and Innovation. Uh, to, uh, today, uh, we are going to uh, uh, have a, a very interesting lecture uh, on the golden 15 minutes of trauma resuscitation. Uh, before moving to the lectures, a uh, few uh, instructions for the participants. Um, so uh, to avoid interactions during the lecture, kindly mute your microphones and turn off the camera during the presentation. And uh, this lecture will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube later. So uh, asking questions, uh, question time at the uh, end of the webinar. If you have any questions, please type it into the chat box. Please change your chat setting to all panelists or attendees so that your questions can be answered. If you have very specific questions about your situation, please email us onto the uh, link uh, on screen. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Harendra Kure, uh, acting consultant, uh, emergency physician, currently attached to Neurotrauma Center at National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Thank you for joining us uh, today. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dinukshi, and uh, a warm welcome and a good morning to all of you. Um, let me at the onset thank the Sri Academy uh, for giving me this uh, privilege really to speak to the general body of the Government Medical Officers Association. Uh, it is indeed uh, a pleasure to be able to uh, give back something to this uh, wonderful organization uh, of which I have been a member for the last 25 years. Uh, so we always take things from um, the Government Medical Officers Association, but it is extremely important that we also give something back. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, and over the next uh, 25 minutes, I'm going to share with you uh, some important aspects in the management or the initial management of a trauma patient. Um, and you might actually be bewildered to know that uh, this is in fact the second such lecture that you all are listening to within the space of two weeks. So that in itself tells you how important it is uh, that we are aware of the different approaches that we need to adopt when we are managing um, a trauma patient. And uh, let me now share my slides. moment. Fine. So I hope uh, that's clear on, on the screen. Um, yes. Yeah, so the golden 15 minutes of uh, trauma resuscitation is the topic um, that I'm going to dwell upon over the next 20 minutes. So you might be wondering how can you do this um, 15 minutes of trauma resuscitation in 20 minutes? It's quite a task. Well, that's why we are considered emergency physicians. Nothing is impossible for us. A uh, few things to note, uh, actually a few take home points that I really want to impress upon over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, and um, you will notice in my uh, presentation that there are certain texts that appear in gold. Uh, and if at the end of this 20 minutes, if you can recall some of those, uh, I, my job would be done really. Remember, um, trauma is a very common presentation and whatever um, sort of um, seniority, whether you are a junior doctor, a very senior doctor, um, I'm sure each one of you have uh, encountered a patient uh, following trauma. Uh, what evidence base has showed over the last few uh, years is that uh, there are two or three very important factors that drive down the um, mortality and the morbidity of uh, trauma victims. And uh, that is exactly what I'm trying to um, impress upon uh, you today. Uh, what really boils down to is number one, is to identifying as early as possible from the time of the primary injury to the time that you actually attend to the patient uh, to identify patients who are in a, a state of shock. And the shock most often is due to hemorrhagic hypervolumic shock. 
uh, and the presentation can be they may be in in compensated state uh, or they may be dwelling into a decompensated state so that is absolutely important that we identify uh, through a very objective assessment process uh, and then we uh, initiate uh, the appropriate resuscitation a second important factor that evidence has uh, shown us is that uh, early uh, estimation of blood loss and early resuscitation uh, with blood and blood products are probably uh, the two most important aspects that we can adopt to drive down the mortality and the morbidity of trauma patients. Right, so um, familiar, possibly building to many of you who um, work in the National Hospital of Sri Lanka and uh, some of you who may have actually passed the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. So the, the image on the uh, right side of the screen is the uh, is where I'm, I'm working currently as the acting consultant emergency physician. Uh, I, I occupy a little space in the ground floor of this very, very impressive building. This is the Neurotrauma Center. Uh, and we actually manage uh, critically uh, ill uh, neurotrauma patients. Uh, it's not always just neurotrauma, sometimes it is polytrauma, but with an overriding neurotrauma as well. Uh, currently, uh, we have actually um, stepped up and uh, put up our hands to convert uh, our unit into a critical care COVID unit uh, with the primary, uh, in, uh, primary sort of um, uh, intention to manage uh, neurosurgical COVID patients, but uh, because of the need of the country, we have actually stepped up to manage even uh, complex COVID pneumonias. Right, so that having said where I'm working, uh, on the left part of the screen is an image of uh, the Canberra Hospital, uh, and that is where I spent my uh, two years of foreign training in the emergency department. This is a tertiary care trauma center. Uh, we see a lot of trauma. Uh, we see a lot of retrieval from uh, varied uh, accompanying states. Uh, they bring in air retrieval uh, trauma victims to us. Uh, so that's where I actually trained as an emergency physician. Now, distinctly, you can notice in these two pictures, there are a lot of similarities, but there are also dissimilarities, right? You can see very imposing two, two buildings, which are nearly the same color. Uh, now, lovely uh, blue sky with a touch of cloud cover on, on both the images. But what you notice here in the picture from Canberra, as opposed to the picture from Colombo, is that uh, you see pedestrians walking on the street uh, in the picture from Colombo, you see an ambulance already coming into the neurotrauma center, but you see this very serene kind of look of the outside of the Canberra emergency department, but don't make, don't uh, let it fool you. This is a very busy, busy uh, emergency department with about 230 to 300 patient presentations. And every day we get pretty serious trauma victims. But what I'm trying to show you here in the onset at this very first slide is that there are systems in play. And unfortunately, Sri Lanka, uh, is you know lacking that ability to conform to a system. It is a systematic approach uh, that is absolutely essential, even when you are managing trauma victims. So you can see that there is designated parking areas. Nobody is walking on the road. So system is in place, uh, and people conform to the system, and that that actually improves uh, outcome and makes uh, managing trauma victims even easier. So ED is actually a very efficient department. Uh, why we uh, we kind of um, call, claim to be efficient is basically because of a few few things that we are very very concerned about. Number one is preparation, and as you can see, even when we are uh, anticipating or when we get a trauma patient, uh, we are already prepared, and this is absolutely important if you are going to provide this initial. Uh, resuscitation of a trauma patient within 15 minutes, right? So emergency physician pride on a motto, and that is uh, what we say is um, we do things slow because it's smooth and, 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 and smooth is fast, if you get my point. So if you do things smoothly and slowly, uh, because you are doing it in a very uh, sort of controlled way, uh, your, you can actually attend to many, many things very fast. Okay, so preparation is paramount. And in this image, you can see this gentleman with folded arms uh, with a very empathetic smile on his face. And that is Dr. Dave Lamont. Uh, he was a senior staff specialist at the Canberra Emergency Department. And everybody is a kind of mentor to become an emergency physician like him. 
uh, you can see from the man, he's absolutely confident. He's able to manage any kind of situation. He can be a team leader. He can be a team member equally well, uh, supportive, uh, supporting his team uh, during a, a, a difficult trauma resuscitation. On the background, that is uh, one of our uh, one of our resource bays in the Canberra Emergency Department. Again, you can see how well prepared it is. It, everything is in order. Everything uh, that you need uh, in in managing or resuscitating a patient is available. It has its designated place. So all of these things ensure that efficiency is at its best, and this uh, enables us to attend to our patients uh, in a systematic way. Uh, remember, all this equipment that you see at the back all available even in our resource stretched um, uh, emergency department or the accident and emergency center in the national hospital. But the difference is, is it systematically organized? Now that is the question to be answered. And next important aspect in managing a trauma patient is the team approach. And that cannot be overemphasized, uh, especially when we are managing a, a trauma victim, because a single person, a single single mindset cannot really manage uh, everything and every complexity that a trauma patient uh, presents with. Okay, so you need a team approach, and that team involvement is absolutely essential to drive down this morbidity and mortality uh, when we are approaching a trauma patient. Uh, when I mean team. Uh, what I mean is it has to be a cohesive team. Uh, every member counts. Uh, every member's involvement is essential. Whether you're the most junior doctor or the most senior consultant on the floor, uh, your role has to be played uh, with, the, with the intention uh, of making the best possible care for your patient who is in front of you. And that is absolutely essential. So your team cohesion is absolutely important. And obviously one brain cannot manage everything. So everybody's collective decision-making assessment uh, is absolutely essential to, make, uh, to come about with a good outcome. Mechanism of injury is something that is always important for you to elicit. And now with the advent of a very, very well-organized uh, pre-hospital care system in the form of the 1990 source area ambulance service, uh, this uh, is something that is really in favor of uh, managing our trauma patients because these uh, EMTs will present at the site. Uh, they are able to assess the patient on site. Um, they are able to gather valuable information in regards to the, the uh, mechanism of injury. And this can be so very important for us uh, in the initial uh, resuscitation of our patient. Why is it so important? Because we can actually focus on certain life-threatening uh, injury patterns uh, just based on the mechanism of injury, the force involved, the area of impact, uh, and also information regarding to the site of where the patient was found. Was the patient found in a whole lot of blood, a whole lot of bleeding? Uh, was there no bleeding at all? Uh, so all of these, even the negatives are valuable. So mechanism of injury is absolutely essential for us to elicit. So what we must strive to do is, uh, as part of our team uh, approach, one of the team members should uh, you know, should uh, focus uh, on this and get gather this valuable information from whichever source you can while the initial resuscitation is in progress, because this is absolutely important uh, in our management and in making this efficient management and making this 15 minutes count, because you can focus on uh, certain areas uh, that you need to know whether there is any injury that might pose a threat to life immediately. Right. Okay, so the systematic approach. Now, um, assessment and detecting a problem and then fixing it and then moving on and reassessing, and that's kind of the second mantra that emergency physicians adopt. So our assessment has to be very objective. That is why you find emergency physicians on the floor, right? We, we have to be by the side of the bed. Uh, because we need to be reliable with our assessment. Uh, we need to be as objective as possible, as early as possible to make a decision in regards to the management of this patient. So we need to identify certain uh, important um, clinical situations. Uh, in, and in, in regards to a trauma patient, um, these are absolutely essential. So we need to identify what is called a critical airway compromise. And the moment we notice that it is, we need to fix it. 
that is absolutely essential that is number one number two is we have to identify catastrophic bleeding and we need to correct it and control it with the most simplest method to be employed initially and then decide on how we progress in that management but these have to be identified at the time the patient presents to us we need to identify certain immediate life-threatening conditions which are absolutely time critical because even a few minutes that go by without us identifying it uh, can cause a mortality or even uh, contribute to morbidity. We need to be absolutely objective in our search for concealed hemorrhage. And when I mean concealed hemorrhage, there are so many body cavities which we cannot uh, assess just by the naked eye, where uh, certain significant uh, blood can accumulate, which may go unnoticed if we do not objectively look for it or search for it. So that is absolutely essential. So these assessment parameters are very, very important when we are managing a trauma patient. Then going hand in hand with assessment, as we find a problem, we need to fix it. And that is what really uh, entails resuscitation in this whole uh, management uh, principle. So we need to ensure airway patency. We need to be sure that our patient cannot, can protect their own airway. If not, we need to protect it for them. Uh, and always remember a cervical spine movement restriction until you are able to objectively rule out a cervical spine injury. And we need to ensure adequate oxygenation and we need to ensure adequate ventilation uh, that we are able to remove carbon dioxide uh, to, the, to the accepted amounts. So early commencement of blood and blood product transfusion is absolutely paramount in the management of a trauma patient. If you have found and identified that the patient has in fact lost a significant amount of blood, which is causing a clinical state of hypovolumic shock, then early commencement of blood and blood product transfusion, again, may I repeat this, this is absolutely essential. Right, so when I alluded to uh, the, the assessment of identifying a critical airway compromise, what I really mean, meant was two very important entities that you need to pick at the time of presentation. One is burns. If your patient was involved uh, in, a, uh, in a scenario where the mechanism of injury uh, was a trauma, but the patient was also in an environment with, uh, with uh, fumes or burning uh, environment, there's a likelihood that they can have inhalational injury to the airways. And these signs of in inhalational injuries have to be looked for if you are told that your patient was involved with the mechanism of an environment in which there was a fire. Uh, these are This is absolutely essential. Uh, this is something you need to pick early. Uh, and if you notice any of these signs or symptoms, you need to secure this airway as early as possible. Because if you don't, uh, this is uh, going to get compromised critically and you're going to lose the airway and you might even lose your patient or you might add to the increased morbidity of this trauma patient. So remember any burns victim or a patient involved in a trauma in, a, in, a, uh, in an environment that is conducive for inhalational burns, you need to consider airway securing in this patient at the onset. Second thing to be looking out for is expanding hematomas in the, in the neck region. Uh, again, it, uh, it is important and imperative that you um, find out the mechanism of injury. If there was a stab injury, a penetrating injury to the neck, uh, and if you are anticipating that uh, there is a possibility of a, a major vessel uh, disruption in this area and that, that leads to an expanding hematoma, that airway needs to be secured early because if this um, hematoma completely critically compromises the patency of the upper airway, um, you're going to end up with a possible mortality and definitely increase morbidity in your patient. So that is number two that you need to identify early and you need to act upon as early as possible. Third important thing in regards to a critical compromised airway is a patient who is refractory, having refractory hypoxia. Uh, with an increase in the amount of oxygen that you're giving to the patient, you're unable to push that um, 
saturation beyond 90%. Uh, this again is a very worrying situation in a trauma patient. And that is a situation where you might want to intubate your patient as early as possible. So these are three important aspects of critically compromised airways that we need to assess for, we need to detect early, and we need to intervene as early as possible. So managing a critically compromised airway in the emergency department is a totally different ball game from managing an airway say in a controlled situation like you know oper operating theater so it, 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 it entails a risk uh, to life uh, when you're trying to secure this airway so remember we need to even uh, in a situation of a trauma patient and when you're trying to act as fast as you can please do not uh, overlook these important factors. Uh, let me remind you again the phrase, uh, uh, slow is smooth, but smooth is fast, okay? So you need to have a systematic approach. Uh, most trauma victims may have hemodynamic um, compromise, right? Uh, so prior to intubation, the rule of thumb is try to achieve a systolic blood pressure of at least 80. And how do we do it? Uh, it's difficult but we need to have some preparation beforehand to try and do this. So fluid boluses, such as 250 ml of crystalloids uh, in the form of normal saline or early early um, um, acquiring of uh, O negative blood, if you can, as fast as, as you can. Um, in, in certain um, developed countries, uh, we have O negative blood in our emergency department so that we can actually um, go to it as the patient presents, but in our context, even at the National Hospital, I, I think we still have to request it from the trauma blood bank, but that do that can come pretty fast. So remember, we if we are suspecting hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock, we need to replace and we need to get that systolic blood pressure to at least 80 before we embark on an intubation. This concept of push dose vasopressors may be new to some, maybe some of you are well versed with this. Uh, it is actually the preparation of adrenaline uh, in the form of one in 100,000. So that's very simple to make. So if you make the one in 10,000, which everyone knows, uh, the dose of um, the, the dilution that you make for a cardiac arrest situation, you take one ml of that preparation and dilute it again up to 10 ml. And now you have a one in 100,000 preparation, or you got, uh, uh, you got 10 micrograms in each ml of that preparation. So what you can do is, uh, if you find that your blood pressure, systolic blood pressure is sagging below 80, you can give one ml, one ml push doses until you can prop or bring that blood pressure up to just 80 or above before you embark on your in intubation. So remember hop killers, uh, as in hypotension, hypoxia, and acidosis, these are killers uh, in your attempt to secure an airway with an, in, with an intention of saving your patient's life, you might inadvertently actually create a mortality in your effort. So remember optimization before you intubate your patient is absolutely paramount and essential uh, when you're dealing with a trauma patient with a critically compromised airway. So what do you employ? Do you employ rapid sequence induction? Do you employ delayed sequence induction? Or do you just not do anything and you just go in and secure your tube? And questions as, is, as in, is the GCS 8? Now do I need to secure this uh, airway? Or is this GCS drop? Uh, due to a primary brain insult, or is it due to the hypotension? So, so many questions that you might have to answer before you embark on your intubation. But remember, that's why you have a team at hand. That's why you have to have uh, access and you need to call out to, to your seniors if you're really uh, facing a situation where these absolutely important clinical decisions cannot be made by yourself. So remember, uh, you are trying to save the life of a patient and all these things matter, even in a situation of immense stress. But remember, once again, um, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Okay. Right, so moving on um, to catastrophic bleeding. Now, catastrophic bleeding most often is identified at the site uh, of the trauma victim. Uh, and you may even um, see this only uh, in certain victims uh, at first presentation to you. Uh, but now again, with the advent of the uh, organized pre-hospital care service that is available to Sri Lanka island-wide. And may I tell you, 
uh, we should be really, really uh, filled with pride that this uh, service uh, is in par with even some of the leading developed countries and our response time is amazingly low. It's around 13 minutes uh, comparable to even a place like Singapore. So it's absolutely Okay, um, I think I'm mute, unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, um, so what is important is to identify catastrophic bleeding as early as possible. So this is what I'm trying to impress upon. So even if your patient has been retrieved uh, without this identification, it is up to us to find this and we need to identify this early and we need to attend to it at the site of the patient. So very often we see catastrophic bleeding in terms of injuries to the limbs uh, because the vessels uh, that uh, the major vessels that supply the limbs can be uh, directly injured. So you have vessel bleeding, which can be catastrophic. It could be venous bleeding or arterial bleeding. So that can lead to a catastrophic state where you lose so much of blood volume in such a short period of time. And this is why it is termed catastrophic. Limb vessels, um, as I mentioned, can be um, punctured and this can also uh, cause catastrophic bleeding. Base of skull fracture, something that we miss most often. Why? Because we don't really see this with our open eyes because most of this profuse bleeding that takes place from a very, very vascular bed in the base of skull uh, is either swallowed or aspirated by the patient depending on the level of consciousness. So something that goes undetected, base of skull fractures, but they do bleed profusely and actually it can cause catastrophic bleeding, something that you should be concerned about uh, when you're um, finding out the mechanism of injury. Scalp lacerations, very often underestimate the blood loss. You can actually lose a fair amount of uh, blood uh, through, a uh, through a scalp laceration, especially if you are dealing with a, a, a pediatric um, patient, right? Uh, because the body surface area, uh, the head entails a larger body surface area and any, and the circulation to the scalp is so profuse uh, that uh, you can lose a fair amount of blood volume in a short period of time. So remember, these are important things for you to keep in mind when you're managing your trauma patient. So how do you control uh, massive external hemorrhage or catastrophic? It's very simple. The, the method you adopt is the most simplest thing to do first, and then you progress uh, with the more complex um, uh, procedures um, as, as you try to control uh, your bleeding. So wound dressing, direct pressure, indirect pressure, uh, injecting uh, substances such as um, adrenaline or tranexamic acid, uh, packing the bleeding side, uh, uh, um, applying hemostatic agents such as gel foam. Uh, and of course, the last go-to, especially in limb trauma, is the tourniquet. And this is absolutely important to keep in mind that a tourniquet uh, can uh, be such a useful device uh, in, in limb trauma, uh, where you can actually uh, halt this catastrophic bleeding until you gain a su sufficient control uh, because you, you want to save the life. Uh, I know there's a compromise to the limb with the circulation being shut off, but remember, we are trying to save the life first uh, and then we can be concerned about the limb. So remember, these are absolutely essential. These are simple methods. These are fast methods that you can employ. So in your initial resuscitation, you need to employ these simple things first. And that will definitely improve uh, mor morbidity and prevent mortality. Fine. Now, the identification of early shock. Now, this is absolutely important. And as you can see, that's why this, uh, the, the term shock is in gold. But we as emergency physicians and also uh, doctors uh, and nurses and other support healthcare workers in the emergency departments, we need to assess our patients as objectively as we can. So subjective assessment is not uh, really the go-to when you're managing a trauma patient. So what are the objective ways that you can decide or decipher that this patient may be in a state of shock? Well, there are so many clinical parameters that we can 
think of. But what is important is we need to stick to something that is simple that we everybody can remember and you can consistently use it again and again. I know there are grades of shock. There are grades of shock uh, that uh, are, are sort of the accepted norm, uh, especially in the advanced trauma life support um, um, courses and uh, teachings. Uh, but that sometimes can be a bit daunting because there are so many different parameters that need to be assessed and there are so many variations in the, in the grading of it and the severity. So that sometimes is not that practical in a stressful situation and especially when you're trying to uh, resuscitate a trauma patient within a short period of time but something very easy to remember is something that we now employ which is validated uh, mind you uh, as a clinical decision making tool uh, and that is the shock index and the shock index basically is a very simple calculation you divide the heart rate by the systolic blood pressure and you get a, a ratio and what, what is told is if your shock index is more than one, now that is a bad prognosticator. And that is an indicator for many, many things that you can actually objectively decide uh, on doing, such as intubating our patient, such as activating a massive transfusion protocol, such as uh, looking very, very carefully uh, for concealed hemorrhage if it is not quite obvious where this patient has lost the patient's uh, blood. Okay, so shock index, absolutely important to remember, something that can be employed, but it is not something you employ in isolation, uh, but it is an objective assessment that you can do when you are assessing your patient. Now, delta shock index, what is delta shock index? Well, delta shock index is merely uh, the difference if you have an objective assessment of your patient at the site of injury, if somebody, say an EMT, has a, 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 uh, actually uh, recorded the heart rate and the blood pressure, then that is the first objective assessment of these two clinical parameters or vital signs. If that is there, and then the patient presents to you in the hospital emergency department, and then you objectively assess the heart rate and the systolic blood pressure, the difference of the two assessed shock index indices is the delta shock index. And this is also a valuable objective assessor uh, in giving you information regarding the state of shock in your patient. So if the delta shock index is anything equal to 0.1 or more than 0.1, this again is a prognosticator and a decision maker for you to embark on certain management principles. If at any time you find there's an isolated or a persistent drop in the systolic blood pressure of less than 110, this is worrying. If on objective assessment using point of care ultrasonography and using the focus assessment by sonography in trauma, or we, we commonly call this the fast scan, uh, we are able to objectively identify a collapsing um, IVC. This again is a corroborator or objective assessor uh, leading uh, to us to determine that this patient may be in a state of shock. And altered level of consciousness in the absence of severe traumatic brain injury is definitely an indicator that uh, cerebral perfusion is getting compromised and that is the circulation to the brain gets compromised very late on. So the compensatory mechanisms are now trying are failing this patient and he's heading to what is called decompensated shock, you need to act very fast. You need to hunt for the place where he's losing blood. You need to source control, but you need to more importantly, reassess and resuscitate with blood and blood products. So these are some of the objective assessment parameters that you can employ uh, to determine how vigorously and how um, intently you need to resuscitate your patient based on these factors. These are objective assessment parameters that you should keep in mind when you're managing a trauma patient. So shock index has its own drawbacks. So remember there are certain caveats that you need to be concerned about. A shock index is not reliable in elderly patients because their ability uh, to mount tachycardia is sometimes limited uh, because of their normal physiological changes that take with aging. Um, so it may not be the best go-to. If your patient is a patient who is a hypertensive patient and who is not treated well, they may actually have a blood pressure reading which really does not reflect the state of shock that they are in. 
So that can be a worry something. If your patient is already on medications which block the heart rate response, such as commonly used drugs, such as beta blockers, then you cannot solely rely on the shock index. So that becomes unreliable. But here is uh, where, again, the delta shock index will come into play. Because if you have a comparison of uh, two shock indices, one at the site of retrieval, one on presentation to you, uh, you can see the difference. And then that might give you an estimate of an objective estimate that your patient may be actually heading for a state of uh, decompensated shock. So these are some things that you need to keep in mind uh, when you are assessing your patient in the emergency department in the most objective way, but always keep these at the back of your mind uh, because you have to be next to your patient and it all depends on that patient in front of you. Right, so our patients with trauma can have any one of these or a combination of all or all three of these types of shock. So hemorrhagic shock obviously is the most common presentation uh, to emergency departments following trauma. So that uh, loss of blood volume um, due to the uh, forces that have uh, worked on the body, uh, due to the uh, impact force, uh, due to the mechanism of injury, uh, and identifying where this blood loss is taking place will obviously um, give, get you thinking that, okay, hemorrhagic shock is the likely cause of shock in this patient. So remember, uh, concealed hemorrhage has to be actively looked for. And you can do this at the bedside in the emergency department in your resuscitation. And point of care ultrasonography is absolutely important. And it is such an important clinical assessment tool in the hands of uh, us emergency physicians and all uh, doctors working in the emergency departments, because all it does for us, it is an additional clinical assessment tool, just like how we learn to listen to um, auscultate uh, the heart and identify uh, certain changes, such as changes in the heart sounds, added sounds in the form of murmurs, or the breath sounds. So it is a clinical um, skill that we gain. And now what we need to add on to our armamentarium of clinical skills is point of care ultrasonography. It is not that we are as knowledgeable as our colleagues in the radi radiology department. No, definitely not. I mean, they are a specialty on their own and their um, input and their knowledge base on, on manipulating the ultrasound machine and giving us such detailed clinical assessment is totally beyond our scope. But what we do is we use the ultrasound probe in a in a sort of a in a predetermined way uh, to visualize what we cannot see from the naked eye, uh, but we need to be sure that what we are visualizing is uh, acceptable. So our ultrasound windows have to be reliable for us to get this yes or no binary answer to a clinical question. So does this patient have? Uh, fluid in the pleural cavity. And because it is trauma, it has to be a hemothorax. Does this patient have fluid in the peritoneal cavity? And because it is related to trauma, it is bleeding into the peritoneal cavity. Does this patient have fluid in the pericardial sac? Because it is following trauma and a suggestive mechanism of injury, this has to be a pericardial tamponade if he is getting compromised with circulation as well. So this is how we can employ at the bedside of our trauma patient using point of care ultrasonography to absolutely corroborate our clinical suspicion and to get clinical answers. The same goes for a lung ultrasound. We can identify certain life-threatening problems such as pneumothorax, uh, massive hemothorax, uh, lung contusion. Uh, all this can be identified at the bedside uh, using point of care ultrasonography. So hemorrhagic shock, concealed hemorrhage is something that we need to look into in any trauma victim who is clinically found to be suggestive of in a state of uh, hypovolumic shock. And if it is trauma, it has to be hemorrhagic shock if we are thinking hypovolumia. The other two entities of shock that can coexist or can be the only um, presentation in a trauma patient is obstructive shock. And the classic inflow obstructive shock uh, subtypes, uh, that is tension pneumothorax, uh, 
and pericardial tamponade, a very common presentation in trauma, something that we have to actively look for and to rule out if we find our patient, patient is in shock. And finally, neurogenic shock, which is the classic uh, uh, type of distributive shock in a patient who has a suggestive mechanism of injury and vital sign changes such as bradycardia with hypotension, uh, where we have to strongly suspect if this patient is in a state of neurogenic shock. So these are absolutely important for us to be aware of when we are assessing our patient in the recess uh, in a short period of time. And don't forget to employ point of care measures. So even bedside imaging through radiology in the form of x-rays, such as the trauma series, a chest x-ray, a pelvic x-ray, cervical spine, if you cannot go on to a CT, uh, you can still get a wealth of information at the bedside. Uh, so these are some things that you have to be concerned and you need to know about because that is going to make a difference in uh, driving down mortality and driving down morbidity in our trauma patients at resus in the initial resuscitation. Right. So some other pointers uh, to um, think about um, in resuscitation, and that is uh, what can be done in the recess itself. So bilateral finger thoracostomies uh, is uh, something that we go to, especially if we are suspecting a traumatic cardiac arrest. Uh, remember, this is a concept that has come about from evidence base, uh, where we find that um, you know going in the mid mid or anterior axillary line in the fourth or fifth intercostal space in the safe area uh, directly with your finger is as smooth and fast as doing it otherwise. Uh, and uh, evidence based suggests that this possibly is a better option uh, if you're suspecting a massive hemothorax, a tension hemothorax, or in the event of a cardiac arrest due to trauma. Application of pelvic binder, I cannot overemphasize the importance of doing this correctly. Uh, you have to all be aware exactly where you apply this binder. Uh, the binder has to go over the greater trochanters of the femur and the knot should be on top of the perineal area. And that is absolutely essential that you are aware of this uh, simple um, treatment modality that can be a lifesaver, that can drive down morbidity, that can limit uh, ongoing hemorrhage. So it's something that everyone should practice and be sure and, uh, and do it if you have a suspicion that the mechanism of injury may have subjected your trauma patient to uh, uh, unstable pelvic fracture, even before you have imaging to confirm it. There's no harm in applying a pelvic binder, uh, even if they don't, but if they do and you didn't, now that can lead to increased mortality and increased morbidity. Tranexamic acid, again, evidence-based, uh, that its use is indicated within the first three hours of a trauma patient. Uh, there was subset analysis of uh, the CRASH trials that have said there is a beneficial uh, role of tranexamic acid in certain indications in even traumatic brain injury. But remember, you had to do this within the first three hours. Uh, beyond three hours, the, its effectiveness becomes less. So the risk benefit drops more towards risk than benefit because tranexamic acid in itself, it is an antifibrinolytic agent and it, it in itself has certain risk factors. But given the context that you are managing a trauma patient in the first three hours, uh, evidence-based suggests that the, that the outcome benefit outweighs the risk. Uh, so please, it's a go-to. So it is a simple dosing uh, that we employ in the trauma setting, even in recess. Uh, that is one gram of tranexamic acid diluted in 100 cc of normal saline, and that has to be pushed in uh, over 10 minutes. And the following one gram goes in over a period of eight hours uh, for your trauma patient as ongoing care proceeds. Right, so these are some of the things that you should be aware of. I'm sure most of you are aware, but these are evidence-based driven uh, practices that we employ now in managing and in the initial management of a trauma patient. Blood and blood product transfusion and activation of the massive transfusion protocol, absolutely essential. Uh, probably one of the most important factors in initial management where we determine that our patient needs aggressive um, 
uh, replacement of blood and blood products. So remember, you have to have a good rapport with the blood bank. Uh, you need to somehow other indicate to them in advance that your patient in resus needs uh, blood and blood products, and you might have to actually trigger the massive transfusion protocol. And that depends on your local establishment. Uh, so you best is to have a working understanding with your colleagues in the blood bank and see how uh, well you can activate uh, your massive transfusion protocol. Now, remember, activation means you can also deactivate if you think it is not essential after you initiate a resuscitation. So it is not a, not a crime to have activated a massive transfusion protocol and then deactivate it. But it is definitely a crime if you did not activate the massive transfusion protocol when your patient actually needed blood and blood products fairly fast for resuscitation because they were in a state of hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock. Vasopressors, and the vasopressor that I'm talking about is no adrenaline uh, and something that you need to start early, even in emergency department in the resus room, if you're strongly suspecting a neurogenic state of shock. Because remember, the primary insult again to the central nervous system is always the same principle. Whatever happened, during the impact or during the trauma mechanism, you cannot reverse. But what we are trying to prevent is secondary insult. So oxygenation, blood supply, perfusion, same principles apply to the spinal cord. So you cannot um, sort of expect a good favorable outcome in a, in a victim with a spinal cord injury if you cannot maintain perfusion. So remember, uh, the nature of this insult, even in trauma, is that your patients will present with hypotension and you need to prop up that mean arterial pressure to at least above 70 and you need to go for vasopressors early, early vasopressors even in the resource. And remember, uh, now there is a clear indication to uh, starting vasopressors through a peripheral line. You do not need central venous access at the first go-to. Uh, if you consider that this patient will be on long-term vasopressors, yes, then there is a place for central venous access, but definitely it's not the limiting factor to initiate vasopressor support in your patient in the emergency department. You need to get in a good IV cannula and then uh, start your vasopressors as early as possible if it is indicated in the form of a neurogenic shock in trauma. So coming to vascular access, it cannot be overemphasized that this simple uh, management principle is so important, uh, not only for initial resuscitation, but even for ongoing care. If your patient is going on towards the operating theater, if your patient is going into the trauma ICU, uh, this initiation of good, uh, dependable vascular access in the resuscitation room will be such an important aspect uh, in the overall mor morbidity and even mortality uh, of your patient. So remember two large bow peripheral IV cannula, when I mean large bow is this 18 or upwards and the easiest access sites would be in the cubital fossa. So you have three possible large veins to access. You got the Catholic bracket, uh, bracket, 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 and the, um, and the median cubital vein, all three are generally of a large caliber and you can fit in a large bow cannula into this. So go for that uh, ideally on either side, but depending on the, the site of injury, sometimes you might have to vary the position, but always remember IV access initially is absolutely paramount and the earlier you get it, the easier it is uh, and it's going to be of most benefit to your trauma patient. Intraosseous access is another go-to when you find that all peripheral veins are collapsed, but unfortunately we do not have the, the proper IO device to gain access into uh, the bone marrow, uh, which is a huge vascular bed. Uh, and for resuscitation purposes, uh, for initial blood um, sampling, um, and it is absolutely a lifesaver if you have uh, the proper um, devices to get access into the bone marrow, uh, which is a large vascular bed. So you can, you can transuse blood and blood products. You can transuse 
uh, fluid boluses, you can give drugs. It is an absolutely life-saving access into a very useful vascular compartment. The only caveat is remember, if you do have intra, uh, intramedullary access or IEO, intraosseous access, uh, when you're trying to send uh, an infusion into the um, into the bone marrow, it has to be under pressure. Uh, simple gravity, as we normally employ uh, sending fluids and even in blood and blood products, uh, just employing the height of your saline stand does not work with an IEO access. You have to attach a pressure bag to whatever you are trying to give, whether it is a uh, saline bottle, uh, whether it is blood and blood products, it has to be infused under pressure if you are going through intraosseous access, something that you need to be aware of. Right, so moving on, um, these concepts of controlled resuscitation in the emergency department in this initial 15 minutes is something that is absolutely important as well. These are again generated by evidence base. Uh, so what we find is that uh, we do not want to give large volumes of crystalloids in an attempt to prop up the perfusion. Uh, what we, the go-to is small boluses of crystalloids until we get our blood and blood products on board because we're dealing with the hemorrhagic shock patients. So our initial goals would be to just keep that systolic blood pressure above 70 until the blood and blood products uh, are available for us to transfuse. Remember, over zealous large crystalloid resuscitation actually is counterproductive. It actually drives up mortality, drives up morbidity. So please be aware that you need to limit your crystalloid resuscitation even in a patient who may be having a feature suggestive of hypovolumic shock. You need to get blood and blood products on board as early as possible because this uh, large doses of crystalloids just propagate this vicious cycle uh, that we are all aware of, that is coagulopathy, acidosis, and hypothermia. And uh, crystalloids in the form, especially of normal saline, it, it adds to every component of this vicious cycle and you drive this vicious cycle uh, and just worsening the state of the patient. So remember, uh, you do this very cautiously, but you need to uh, buy time until you get blood and blood products on board. And the newer concepts that are coming up in trauma resuscitation is the role of calcium. Uh, calcium seems to be an absolutely essential and an integral part in the coagulation cascade. Uh, so, uh, you know, the bleeding in itself, lo you lose calcium. Uh, blood and blood products, which are in the form of with citrated products, chelate calcium. So there is this concern that we may be actually, um, um, you know, kind of, propagating hypocalcemia even in our resuscitation attempt. So this diamond uh, of uh, the lethal diamond and the role of calcium, where calcium uh, plugs into all corners of this uh, diagram, uh, there is now um, a consider considerable evidence base that is being generated whether we should actually uh, include calcium in our trauma resuscitation protocols, but it hasn't formally been introduced. So I'm just, uh, introducing to you to this concept um, and don't be kind of um, surprised if somebody tells you uh, let's give this patient some calcium gluconate uh, in, in a setting of trauma uh, where there is a lot of blood uh, products that are to be infused and also you are managing a hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock patient. So calcium seems to be uh, something that is looming in the horizon there where we can actually employ in managing uh, trauma patients in the resource in emergency departments. Right, so coming back to triggers of uh, massive transfusion protocols, remember to activate the massive transfusion protocol, there are certain objective uh, parameters that you can actually assess. So obviously shock index and delta shock index uh, is something that we can be driven by. 
But there are certain clinical uh, decision making tools that are also available, such as the ABC score, uh, something that you can easily uh, look up in. Uh, if you go to MD Calc, um, all of you guys and girls have smartphones, just download it. It's a free download. Um, and you type ABC score, it will give you the parameters. All you need to do is enter them if, uh, as you assess them objectively on your patient, and it will give you a score. And if, it, if the score is two or more, uh, that, that is a one more trigger for you to think about activating the mass massive transfusion protocol and this comes into play mostly in penetrating mechanism of injury but even otherwise it, it is something to corroborate your decision it is not the sole one but it's something that you can add on uh, in making your decision more easier whether to activate the massive transfusion protocol or not then the other concept of resuscitation intensity how much of resuscitation and how aggressively are you actually resuscitating your patient now uh, is another indicator that you might want to consider activating the transfusion massive transfusion protocol so if you are using four units of anything uh, to keep that systolic blood pressure at 70 that means this is is a trigger for you to consider uh, activating the massive transfusion protocol okay um then the concept of goal directed um, um blood and blood protect uh, um resuscitation is something of importance because balanced blood products that is in this ratio of one is to one is to one can you just give me a moment i might have to just uh, attach my power source to the laptop So sorry about that interruption to the flow, uh, but otherwise I would have completely you know, lost you. Um, so um, the the concept of uh, blood product um, replacement again evidence driven, uh, where we find that balanced blood product um, um, transfusion is the go to uh, in this situation. Um, so when you mean what what is meant by a one is to one is to one ratio is that the products that we are transfusing uh, transfusing our patient is uh, red cell concentrate, a fresh frozen plasma, and platelets. And what is meant by a ratio is that a unit uh, which comprises which is basically calculated on the patient's body weight. So blood uh, is generally ten ml per kilogram, uh, FFP fifteen ml per kilogram, and platelets. A 10, uh, one unit of platelets for every 10 kilograms of your patient. So that comprises a unit for your patient. So if you are giving one of that in blood, in that volume, you had to match it with one unit in that volume of uh, FFP and a volume of platelets, which is an equivalent to your patient. So that is the concept of this ratio, which is one is to one is to one. Now you immediately start giving red cell concentrate in the emergency department. And you might have to actually give about four units of the uh, calculated um, uh, volume uh, in the form of red cell concentrate first. So then you might wonder, it does not matter. The most important thing to go into your patient first is the blood. Uh, you can catch up on the other components as you progress with the ongoing care of your patients. Sorry about that. I can just touch. Um, so that is an important concept. This one is to one is to one uh, ratio to be maintained when you're uh, transfusing, uh, transfusing blood and blood products. And generally, the blood bank will just keep giving you these products in this ratio, uh, pack after pack or box after box, because it will, they will conform to the, uh, the protocol in your institution and provide you if you have activated this massive transfusion protocol. So it is for you uh, as part of the team managing the resuscitation to check the products and just infuse them uh, the best way you can into your patient as fast as you can, guided by 
the uh, clinical parameters that you are seeing. So a goal-directed blood product transfusion can be guided by a point of care a utility in the form of uh, vesico elastometry, uh, which is a concept that is in, in practice in most developed countries, but unfortunately, uh, probably it's a bit of a expensive resource to have in, in our context, but it's something that you should be aware of. Uh, one of these uh, is a Rotam, uh, which is uh, which is a um, um, rotational thromboelastometry, uh, which is a go-to uh, in resuscitation, even in trauma patients. And it's very simple. It's very user-friendly. You can do it at the bedside. It generates this um, simple diagram, which then you can interpret uh, based on the shape. Uh, more objective numbers also appear on it. But for for people who who just are good at visualizing shapes. Uh, especially you can see the similarity that these are all the shapes of wine glasses. And if you are one of those who, you know, have a glass of wine every day in the evening, uh, this is going to be so easy for you to remember. So the brandy glass shape is the normal shape that you would expect when there's no need for any blood and blood product replacement. Uh, the wine glass uh, tells you that you need to give uh, FFP because you need, there's fact factor deficiency in that case. The champagne flute, would say that you are sh you are low in fibrinogen uh, and then you need to think of either fibrinogen or cryoprecipitate uh, which is a surrogate uh, that will provide fibrinogen the test tube is uh, if you've got thrombocytopenia and platelet dysfunction so you need to uh, you need to up the platelet and finally uh, if you get the inverted martini glass that is that there's ongoing thrombolysis uh, where you might have to consider continuing something like tranexamic acid, which is the antifibrinolytic agent to control the ongoing coagulopathy uh, induced by trauma. So this is something that you should be aware of. Unfortunately, practically, we cannot employ this uh, at the moment, but there's something uh, that is always there to improve um, the patient care at the bedside, uh, which is obviously going to help in driving down the mor morbidity and preventing mortality. Right, so I may have just stretched my talk a little long. Uh, and just to summarize, um, the approach is absolutely important in the emergency department when we are resuscitating a trauma patient. And the approach has to be systematic, it has to be very thorough, and it has to be team-based uh, if you want to uh, be successful. And uh, my analogy is always the 1996 World Cup winning team led by Arjuna Rantunga. Everybody played a role in that team. And that is exactly why we won the World Cup in 1996. 1996 is a very special year for me because that is also the year that I uh, started my clinical practice uh, as an intern. And that is also the year that I joined the Government Medical Officers Association. So early detection of shock uh, is absolutely important. And how do you determine this? It is only through objective assessment and the vital parameters are essential. That is heart rate, blood pressure, mean arterial pressure, respiratory rate, saturation, uh, and body temperature. These are absolutely essential for you to objectively assess uh, the use of point of care ultrasonography, uh, the use of point of care imaging, all of these things are so important to detecting shock in its earliest form so that you can start your resuscitation uh, process early. Aggressive resuscitation, uh, securing that dynamic compromised airway, blood and blood products coming on board early. And please work with your trauma surgeons and find out exactly where the trauma surgeon wants this patient to go into. Uh, does he believe that this patient is going to benefit from coming into the operating theater? Please ensure that you provide him that, uh, that disposition plan uh, to the best of your ability to give the trauma surgeon uh, the patient so that he can carry out his exceptional skills in managing this patient. Does this patient warrant trauma intensive care? Then find a trauma intensive care bed if you can and take your patient in. But if this patient is fully resuscitation stable, goes into an acute trauma ward. So remember disposition, which has to be appropriate is again the gambit of the emergency department and the So morbidity, mortality are minimized.
um, I hope my internet connection was a little wonky. I hope you heard the last bit. All I said was during the dynamic airway, uh, early blood and blood products and appropriate disposition is absolutely essential for a good outcome in your resuscitated patient. So finally, um, if there's nothing that you remember from this um, a bit lengthy discussion, which I didn't anticipate would take so long, I leave you with this message. Uh, this is the trauma dance. I taught my uh, youngest daughter. Uh, she was just uh, four years old. She's now a teenager and absolutely livid that I use this in my trauma lecture. But just bear with me for a few seconds and listen to what she has to say. Again, clearly, you are not clear. Come on. Say clearly, Dad. So all she's saying is the trauma dance, which I thought, and she picked it up so well uh, that it, I, I always thought I should use this at some point in my career if I ever get the opportunity. And that's exactly what. So what she's talking about is looking for, actively looking for these places for concealed hemorrhage and never forget all around. Uh, so that is where the EMTs play a role. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, sorry, I went a little overboard uh, in, in terms of um, time. Um, but I, I suppose there may be um, questions in the chat box. Um, so yes, I will, um, yeah. So I can take- very much. Thank you I very much sir, for that excellent presentation. And thank you for sharing with us your experience uh, and the positive vibes that you always carry on. So we have a few queries uh, from the participants and uh, yeah. certain questions we have already answered. So I'll be repeating the question so that you can just get it uh, uh, prepared for the answers. So the first question from a participant, uh, what is the rationale behind the correction of hypertension prior to intubation? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, rationale of correcting hypotension before intubation, because now you know that um, for the, pro the procedure of intubation, we have to use certain drugs, uh, obviously, uh, to um, kind of uh, sedate your patient, uh, to muscle paralyze the patient. So all these uh, drugs uh, tend to um, suppress or depress the cardiac contractility or the functioning of the heart. So what, what happens is if you don't start with a blood pressure of a reasonable amount, just the insti installation of these medications are going to depress it, depress it some more and you might actually end up uh, with a cardiac arrest when you're trying to intubate your patient. So that is why you need to optimize uh, these factors. That is oxygenate your patient, uh, as best as you can before you embark on intubation and prop up that systolic blood pressure to at least above 80 before you intubate your patient. So uh, the go-tos are uh, push dose adrenaline if you are really struggling, uh, early O negative blood transfusion uh, or boluses of crystalloids uh, to prop up that blood pressure before you actually intubate your patient because you do not want to kill your patient uh, in, a, in an attempt to save the patient's life. Thank you, sir. Uh, at the same time, there's a question. Can you explain adrenaline push dose again? Uh, is it recommended by ATLS? I'm not too sure whether it is recommended by ATLS, but it is a go-to that we practice in emergency departments and it is uh, in the hands of an experienced uh, clinician who is aware of what exactly you're doing. Um, then it is a go-to that we use. But what is important is for your team members to be aware uh, and especially the drugs nurse, uh, if you are going to contemplate using push dose adrenaline, then you need to uh, ensure that you actually see how it is prepared. So may I repeat how it is done? Uh, what you do is 
the the um, one in ten thousand has to be always prepared as part of your emergency drugs. So if you take one of those syringes with one in ten thousand adrenaline, uh, which is a ten cc syringe which has one milligram of adrenaline diluted up to 10 cc you take one ml of that and you dilute it again to another 10 cc of normal saline so you have double uh, diluted that initial preparation so you have now a one in hundred thousand uh, diluted preparation from which you can push doses of one ml which constitute 10 micrograms per ml into your patient at a time for a desired effect. The desired effect is to push your uh, systolic blood pressure to 80 or just above 80 before you embark on your intubation. Um, so that's exactly what you do. So you need to be a clinician who is experienced in using it. Uh, you need to be double sure that is prepared in the proper concentration. Um, and you need to know the indication for using it and what is the end point of using it. So it is push dose, uh, you titrate it to the effect that you want before you embark on intubation. Thank you, sir. And the next question is, uh, can you explain finger thoracostomy again, why it has been done bilaterally? Yeah, so bilateral finger thoracostomy is uh, the, the general go-to in a patient in a traumatic cardiac arrest because you would not know whether there are, um, you know, pneumothoraces on both sides causing tension. Uh, so you, you, before you can even identify because the patient comes into your resuscitation in uh, a cardiac arrest. So that is the place for bilateral finger thoracostomy. Uh, but if you do identify uh, in a patient who is um, you know, not in cardiac arrest, but you do identify bilateral tension pneumothoraces or massive hemothoraces or tension on one side, hemothorax on the other side, when there's a clear indication and your patient is crashing in front of you, uh, then uh, that is the go-to for finger thoracostomy because what they find is, uh, is that uh, the approach um, in that same area that you would embark on uh, uh, insertion of an uh, intercostal drainage tube, tube uh, is the same uh, way to go to using your finger. So that's something that is being practiced in emergency departments uh, in trauma patients. Uh, thank you very much. So there are questions flowing from the participants. Please bear with us. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Question is uh, how to suspect or identify a base of the skull fracture at emergency department? Yes. Um, so there are again, the importance is the mechanism of injury. Um, if you can um, suspect uh, that there's been a, a sort of a load loading um, loading impact on your patient, like a fall from height or something, a heavy object falling on your patient's head, uh, then depending on the trajectory of impact uh, in, in relation to uh, say even a motorbike rider or a motor vehicle accident, right? Um, or obvious signs are if you got uh, bleeding from the uh, ear, a bleeding from the nose, a bleeding from the mouth, you need to suspect basal skull fractures. Uh, the, what, I, what I wanted to impress upon is that it can be catastrophic. It can be a catastrophic source of it, a bleeding because one thing, it, it is partially concealed because the patient will be swallowing the blood and you would not see it. Uh, and you would not see the amount of blood and, and the rate of bleeding. So this is why you have to be concerned uh, until you do your uh, formal imaging in the form of a CT brain, uh, where you get uh, specifically asked for a bone window, and then you can actually identify the extent of the base of skull involvement. But until then, remember in the initial resuscitation, if you have a patient who clinically is showing that he has features of shock, but you cannot find any other council site, but there's blood gushing down from the nose or blood coming out, trickling out from the mouth or from the ears. Remember, it could be, it could be. So something to think about uh, in a situation where you cannot explain something very obviously based of skull fractures, catastrophic bleeding. Thank you, sir. Uh, moving to next question. When should we intubate a conscious patient with inhalation burn? Good question. As early as you have detected it, because uh, in inhalational burns, you had to actively look for those signs and symptoms, and the the you have a very low threshold to make that decision because the earlier you do it, uh, 
the better the outcome. You're going to prevent a disaster. You're going to drive down morbidity. You're going to prevent a mortality. So the worst case scenario is even if you intubate and the patient just you know, recovers perfectly well, um, all you do is you extubate, right? But if you don't, you delay your intubation opportunity, you lose your airway, and then it becomes a total airway disaster. And you do not want to have that on top of a trauma patient who already has other problems uh, compromising his normal physiological function. So remember, mechanism of in injury drives uh, this decision. If your patient was involved in a trauma that, that was in an environment where there was fire, where there was inhalational burn risk, Remember, look actively for these signs and symptoms of inhalational burn and just make that decision and the call. Get the most senior person around to be there for you to secure this airway early. Thank you, sir. And we have got some questions on pelvic, pelvic fractures. Uh, what is the place of FAST in identifying bleeding due to pelvic fracture? How sensitive it is? Well, I mean, you, you identify... Um, you know, sensitivity of fast is also dependent on the operator. Uh, so if you are, if you have the ability to generate uh, um, uh, ultrasound windows, which which have been um, kind of credentialed by somebody who teaches this, uh, then your finding will be uh, uh, will be um, will be validated more or less. So if you find, um, depending on the mechanism of injury and the clinical presentation and you also find that there's free fluid in the pelvic uh, cavity or even in the um, peritoneal cavity uh, then i mean it gives it's just a additional clinical uh, um, skill that you employ to answer your question the question is has this patient suffered uh, has this patient suffered a pelvic fracture causing concealed hemorrhage? And is that the, uh, that is why I see the patient in front of me in recess in, in uh, clinical features showing that he is in shock, in hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock. So it is just uh, an addition for you to be more objective in your assessment. So I don't, I don't know about a number for sensitivity, but um, I just look at it like that. Thank you, sir. And the next question is, uh, is it okay to apply pelvic binders all patients with suspected pelvic fracture because it will increase the damage in a patient with lateral compression pelvic fracture? Well, that is a very technical kind of question which I'm unable to answer to you. Uh, but um, if it is going to, I mean, if you know that it is a lateral pelvic fracture, I mean, how do you assess that other than with the, uh, with, um, um, once you get your imaging, right? So up until that time, if it is, I mean, you apply the uh, binder uh, based on your clinical assessment and you find that things are getting worse, then if you're going to be thoughtful in that sense, then this may be the reason. I mean, you, you, you initiated something simple with the hope that you're going to stabilize, but it's making things worse, then obviously you take it off. Uh, but otherwise, if you don't know whether it is a lateral compression or not, um, how would you not know? And how would you know? Can you clinically say that this is uh, this form of pelvic fracture? So it all depends on the mechanism of injury. Uh, what is the likelihood that it could have caused a lateral compression? So it all depends. So it's again, that's why I say, so you've got a trauma surgeon by your side in your trauma team. And if he tells you, look, mate, you know, don't do this. You don't do it. I mean, you you take his call because he's probably more experienced about analyzing the mechanism of injury and the clinical presentation. So what I'm telling you is, if you have a strong suspicion of a uh, of a pelvic fracture which is contributing to concealed hemorrhage uh, and this and making your patient unstable hemodynamically, I mean, you need to employ. It. That's what I'm trying to say. Excellent explanation, sir. Thank you. And the next question is, sir, which vasopressor should be used for neurogenic shock? It is not adrenaline. There's no, no beating around the bush. Only in this context um, where there are few people who might get reflex bradycardia to noradrenaline, and that is the only situation where you might want to consider adrenaline or dopamine, but dopamine is now not considered a uh, go-to vasopressor at all, but in the context of our practice, sometimes you might have to employ it, but noradrenaline would be the first 
choice vasopressor in neurogenic shock. The only caveat there would be if in certain people it can cause reflex bradycardia. So you're starting off with a bradycardic patient. Um, and if you're going to worsen the bradycardia, it's going to sort of confound the problem. Uh, then you need to switch to possibly adrenaline would be my choice. Dopamine is an option. Thank you, sir. And uh, there are some questions uh, regarding lethal triad. I think you have already explained this. Please go through the recorded video. Uh, so I had given a great explanation. And the next question is, sir, what is the recommended resuscitative fluid? Is it a normal saline or lactate ringers? Yeah, so conventionally in Sri Lanka, we still practice normal saline, but there are issues with normal saline, but we hope to negate that by being very, very cautious in our crystalloid resuscitation, uh, because, you know, normal saline can add to the, um, the hypochloremic acidemia. Uh, so in that context, possibly um, uh, Hartmann or Ringer's lactate would be a better option, but if uh, that's basically up to, up, up to the treating team. You can decide depending on availability, but it has to be a crystalloid and crystalloid alone no um no um gel um none of those colloids no colloids crystallites that's it okay thank you sir and the next question is please explain massive transfusion protocol okay so this is um so what is meant by a massive transfusion protocol is uh, uh, i mean you start transfusing um, blood and blood products in a large quantity so that's why it's called a massive transfusion and the protocol is uh, driven by your transfusion medicine experts in your blood bank so they 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 make a protocol as to which products come in at which stage and in what composition but they stick to this one is to one is to one ratio uh, so what what from a trauma team perspective the important thing about uh, the massive transfusion protocol is really identifying the person who needs it, identifying it early uh, and activating it uh, with a good communication with your blood bank colleagues. Uh, so that is our role in the emergency department for us to assess, to determine, trigger it and communicate and actually physically get the stuff into the patient. There's no point having a massive transfusion protocol in place if it does not go into the patient. So you can have breakages in that link. Uh, so if you want to optimize the efficiency to drive down mortality, to limit morbidity, the massive transfusion protocol has to work uh, with the role of many people. And our role is basically uh, identifying its need early and activating it appropriately and communicating with the transfusion experts and blood bank. Thank you very much. A few more questions to be answered. Uh, what is damage control resuscitation? Um, probably uh, you got a full dose of that uh, from the trauma surgeon. So maybe you can watch that uh, recording. Uh, damage control resuscitation is a talk on its own and the best experts to talk about it are the trauma surgeons. All right, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, that's a practical question. What can be done in a major arterial injury in a peripheral unit? Yeah, so as I mentioned, the go-to would be the simple things first. So, um, I mean, whatever, it depends on the location, whether you are able to identify it, but otherwise the simple things first. So direct pressure, uh, tourniquet, if that is possible. Um, if you can find any, any sort of uh, hemostatic agents to apply over it. Uh, otherwise, you need to apply a suture or a hemo, hemo, hemostatic uh, ligature. So whatever that you are competent in, but you need to do something. So you need to start with the simple thing first and then get either because, again, the importance of managing trauma patients as a team. Uh, so you, get, you need to get the most um, competent person to manage it. But our role is to identify it um, and then get, do something, something to control it until you can do the best. So that is the concept. So it's a team effort. It's a team approach. But in, remember, if you cannot identify it, the vascular surgeon does not have a role because you have not even told the vascular surgeon. Vascular surgeon does not have foresight to know there's a trauma patient in resus who needs vascular surgery. We are the triggers who need to identify it early enough and to give that opportunity to the specialist, to the person who really knows what to do with it. 
but we need to trigger it. We need to identify it. So that is our role as a trauma resuscitation team in the emergency department. Thank you, sir. And the last question is, what is the best IV fluid for a neurotrauma patient? Is it a 3% saline or manitol? Okay, so you're talking about hyper or smaller therapy there. Um, it's very debatable, uh, the indication uh, for hyper or smaller therapy. So if you are in a tertiary care neurotrauma center and you got a patient who has features suggestive of uh, rising intracranial pressure in front of you, and you have consulted or contacted neurosurgeons, and they are just getting ready with theater to take your patient to do an intervention surgically, my go-to would be Manitol. If on the other hand, you are, a, you are managing a patient in recess in a non-neurotrauma setting, and you are maybe trying to transfer your patient into a neurotrauma center, uh, with neurosurgical capabilities, um, I would be very cautious in using Manitol, uh, even if I'm identifying uh, rising intracranial pressures. I mean, you had to, at some point, accept whether you are going to benefit this patient or not. The problem, if you don't have an endpoint in the intervention in the form of neurosurgery, is that Manitol um, causes a, a, a very sudden depletion of the intravascular compartment. And this can confound the problem of perfusion, cerebral perfusion, because what happens is then your, your mean arterial pressure has dropped dramatically. And now you have to pump in more crystalloid fluids to prop up the mean arterial pressure, or you might have to start um, a, a vasopressor to try to bring some normalcy. So this becomes so messy. Uh, and you, in the intention of sort of reducing intra, intracranial pressures, you actually create a more complex situation, which can be uh, more detrimental and harmful to the already existing primary uh, brain injury. So I would go for 3% saline in that situation. So it, it all depends on clinical context uh, because there is no clinical evidence base that shows that one is better than the other or the one is more harmful than the other. So that the choice is the treating clinicians and of course the patient in front of you that you have assist. Thank you very much, sir, for patiently answering for all the questions sir, from our participants. And thanks again for your um, excellent lecture today. And please uh, contributing to us uh, in future to give such wonderful lectures, sir. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank again uh, on behalf of GMOA and Society for Health Research and Innovation. And uh, your talk of appreciation um, will be sent across to you in, a, in the due course, sir. Thank you so much. You're welcome, which is a pleasure. Thank you, sir. And uh, that's all the, uh, so we are here to, I mean, ending the webinar today. So to end the webinar, please find the link in the chat box, uh, give your feedback, fill the post assessment question and receive your e-certificate in the due course. If you have any specific questions, please email to us to the Society of Health Research and Innovation email link, which has been given to you in the beginning. So that's all today for the webinar. Thank you. Have a good day.